very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming to this event. Um, why we collect. It's also a bit of how we collect as well. Um, Throw it in there. And um, I'll just introduce myself. My name's Jane Sawyer. I'm one of the Bluestone members and we've got a few others here. We've got a panel today of speakers, um, Anna Davin, um, Ben Dixon Ward and Ellie Janini. And um, there's a couple of other members around in the audience as well. Um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're on. We're actually just going to call it Nam because we were discussing beforehand. We've got Bunurong, Woiwurrung, Wurundjeri, and um, we don't even know the other one. So we're very, very ignorant and naive of this particular point of location. Because it's sort of on the boundary of the Yeah, area. we're standing on a few. So we'll call it Nam, but we do, the most important thing is we want to acknowledge the traditional owners, the traditional owners of the land, and pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and of course, welcome to any First Nations people who might be here with us, extended people who might be Today's little forum is a little bit about generating interest in our collection and what we do because we've been a little bit secretive, not on purpose, just <laughs> private, um, because we kind of, we collect and then we ferret the pieces away in our homes and we love living with them and we get the benefit of enjoying them, but they don't often see the public light of day. And we are also part of Craft Contemporary 23 Festival, which is on right now, finishing tomorrow. Um, and so we decided that we would show our collection. So when you walk out, if you, if you haven't already had a look, it's behind this curtain facing outwards. This is a window exhibition um, of our current collection, Bluestone 2. So we'd also like to acknowledge Craft Victoria and their efforts in hosting Craft Contemporary 23, which is a month long festival celebrating craft in Victoria. And so we felt that we couldn't really pass up that opportunity to show our humble collection to the public for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> the pathway is that um, of the day is that we'll ask Anna to speak first about the history of how Bluestone came about. Anna Davin is a wonderful um, contemporary jeweller who has been a founding member of Bluestone. So she was right here with us at the, at the beginning. Um, and then Ben Dixon Ward, another wonderful contemporary jeweller and educator, will talk about the transition from Bluestone 1 to Bluestone 2. And Bluestone 1, we're actually on our second collection at the moment, Bluestone 2, which we sort of loosely call it. Bluestone 1, we donated after 10 years of collecting, donated it to RMIT University Art Collection. So it now sits there. Um, under their umbrella, and this is Bluestone too. So Vin will talk about how we navigate. You were instrumental in navigating that being collected by a public collection, which is really wonderful. It's not actually as easy as you might think. <laughs> Just wanting to give something away, it doesn't actually happen that easily. And Ellie Janini, also architect, contemporary jeweler, um, our president at the moment of Bluestone Collection. Ellie will talk about um, the current Bluestone Collection, Bluestone 2, as it is now, and some of the decisions and how we make them and the nitty gritty of how we do that. So, without any further ado, could you please make Anna Devon welcome? I have been a founding member of Bluestone. Um, the, the very first time I heard about Bluestone, the, it wasn't even called Bluestone then, Roseanne Bartley called me up and wanted to have a cup of tea to chat about the idea of instigating a craft collection. Um, how it started initially was that Kevin Murray, um, who is a Melbourne writer and craft advocate, um, the previous um, creative director of Craft Victoria, and Roseanne Bartley, who is a contemporary jeweller, Melbourne contemporary jeweller, were having a cup of tea and they were talking about the need for the a craft collection and to try and encourage the collecting of craft. Um, I actually ran Rosie um, last week to have a chat with her about um, what her memories were and, and a lot of my how what I'm talking about also comes from ideas that you know things that she, we were talking about. She was saying that the, the two initial desires that she and Kevin um, 
uh, initially talked about was to create a craft collection and to develop a group that would meet visiting craftspeople. And you guys might not be aware of that because that never came about. Um, and Rosie was, I, I didn't even remember that, but Rosie was saying that Kevin really wanted um, a, a kind of a body that could meet people who came and say, come and meet all of craft at this, you know, that Bluestone could be this, don't just come and meet the jewellers, come and meet all the crafts people. And um, Rosie said that she thinks that this didn't happen because for two reasons, mainly that we don't get many visiting crafts people, <laughs> and also that our disciplines are still quite siloed, so that's the term that she used, that we really are quite separate, um, jewellery, ceramics, textiles, glass, etc. Um, and, you know, I think that Bluestone has done a lot to break down that siloing, um, particularly for me. Um, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But so the initial members were Rosie and Kevin, myself, Robin Zeeland, who's a ceramicist and has also previously worked um, as a program manager at Craft. Um, Fiona Hiscock, who is the previous president of Craft, um, who is also here, and Ali Lim, who is a jeweller. Um, and just as an aside, one one day when um, Ali was dropping me home after a Bluestone meeting, we had this whole discussion about how I was struggling. You know, the rents in the studio were going up, and I didn't get any teaching work, and blah blah blah. And the next day, she emailed me, and that was the that was the impetus for North City Four. So you could say that North City Four came out of Bluestone, I guess. And North City Four, if you didn't know, was a, a jewelry um, group. Uh, and we said we had studios in Brunswick, and we ran um, classes and had seminars in studio space. And, and so uh, Rosie invited me. We all got together. I think the first meeting possibly took place at Robin Fielding's house. I feel like I've got a feeling we're in a cafe on Flinders Lane. Oh, yes, we were. Yeah. Yes, we were. But a lot of the subsequent, it, um, you know, that yeah. was the initial, like, let's get together. But then we would meet, and often at Robin's place, because she had this great place with a really good big table, and, and that was something. So I, a lot of my memories of the yeah. early meetings were at Robin's place. It was a, a really long process, actually, to get organised. We had to learn a lot about how to run an organisation, what even kind of business structure we wanted to have, um, and how... And, you know, we had to define what our criteria were, what the rules, mission, etc. Um, my first email record that I can find about Bluestone is Kevin emailed me in August, to everybody, in August 2009 with examples of collecting criteria from other collections groups. So, August 2009, our first purchase was made in February 2011. So it took a long time. But it, but it was fun, you know, we were discussing all sorts of things along the way. Um, one of the, um, I'm going to read the mission statement um, and uh, our objectives and scope, etc., um, to tell you what we eventually came up with after much discussion. So our vision was to build a collection that promotes current Australian craft exhibition practice. So we wanted to promote craft people to be exhibiting. So one of the criteria was that we had to purchase from exhibition. Um, and that is something that we've discussed a lot over the years because sometimes we want to go on studio visits and buy from studios, but it was one of the initial criteria that that's what we were going to do. The mission was to support contemporary craft practice and encourage a high standard of exhibition work within Victoria. Our objectives were to develop a knowledge of contemporary craft practice by actively examining and reviewing exhibition practice in Victoria to the acquisition of works on an annual basis by a rigorous selection process and to create a lasting collection of contemporary craft exhibited in Victoria over 10 years. So the works had to be collected from exhibition in Victoria by Australian artists. So the artists could come from interstate, but the exhibitions had to occur in Victoria. Because one of the other things we wanted to encourage, we wanted to encourage craft people to collect and, I mean, to do that, we had to gain a profile, which has always been a bit difficult. But we also wanted to encourage galleries, private commercial galleries, to show contemporary craft. To say that there is a market out there for people who want to purchase and are interested in those kind of craft cultural artefacts. The criteria, now all of this that I'm reading to you is from an old, a, a draft um, rule, book of rules, because when you have a... a, a an incorporated association, you have a rule book and you write all this stuff in it, it has to go to the 
current consumer affairs and the government, etc. Now, um, because of the switch from Bluestone 1 to Bluestone 2, and we're all on Google Docs, Kevin was really a fan of Google Docs, and, and I really hate Google Docs, and I'm sure that there are other people who do too. Anyway, so this is not the official rule book, but I'm pretty sure it hasn't changed much, but I think the draft one that I got was pretty much the last one. But acquisitions will be innovative, be aesthetically compelling, say something interesting about materiality, be by a craftsperson working and living in Australia, and represent on exhibition work, represent work on exhibition in Victoria within the current calendar year. We we also wanted to this is like this is not in the books, but this is from my memory. We wanted to collect works by artists who didn't already have good representation in public galleries. So quite often we've we've dismiss work purely on the reason that that artist is already well represented in public collections. And we also wanted it to be a domestic collection. So we wanted to have the works on display in our homes. Um, oh, that's the first piece, that, that Susan Roby, I can't even The Susan Roby piece was the very first piece that we collected. So the idea of having a domestic collection, but also wanting to be uh, collecting innovative work, often kind of we're at odds with each other. Um, you'll see that Claire McCardle's work, which is like a big meditative kangaroo piece, which was in, it's a kangaroo head, it was in Bluestone One. There was a lot of debate about that because I felt that I think it's a really wonderful piece. I think she, at the time, was a very unrecognised artist and undercollected, and, um, but it, it, it does pose difficulties. However, one of, the, one of the members of the collection had this fantastic place because it has to hang from the ceiling and you pull it by a robe and all of that kind of stuff. So that, that did work. Um, but so often the debate about things around the idea of a domestic collection, you know, was, was very interesting. Um, and then another thing that I was um, never really liked was the fact that uh, it was decided that we weren't allowed to wear the jewellery. And, uh, and I just felt like that was such a shame because the idea of jewellery is so much about the wearability, the, the touching and the being viewed by, by the general public. But anyway, now that the works are, will be in a in public collection and um, Ben will talk about that, that further on. When I was talking to Rosie, I asked her that if, did she think that the Bluestone collection has had an impact, had the impact that she hoped it would. And she says she thinks that it had more. It's, um, she thinks it's fantastic that it went into an important public institution collection. But she said, even though it's, it's not a perfect model because we haven't really raised the profile of collecting, but it still the model that we developed still has value. And I, I do believe that the, the longer it grows on, the more impact we have, particularly on influencing um, commercial galleries to represent craft, which is one of the really important things to, that I personally felt was a really important aspect of, of um, Bluestone. Um, what I think have been the best things for me about being in the Blue Stone is the getting together, the camaraderie, um, and, and just meeting a community of practitioners. There's, I know so many ceramic artists now, um, and uh, I've met lots of textile artists, and just understanding how different um, fields work and the, the ideas that they uh, come up against. Like, I know about jewellery and how that kind of, you know, the theory and the field of jewellery works, and it's been so really interesting to me to um, to learn about all of that kind of stuff. Um, it's, a, it's amazing to be able to actually go out and see a lot more shows because, you know, I'm always struggling to do that, I and mean, you have to do it as part of the Blues Man, it's fantastic. Um, we've had some amazing and interesting discussions and we've never had any blues, which has been really good. We're all very respectful of each other. Um, and it's great to be able to collect work that, that I would love to have in my own personal collection but am unable to afford. Um, so that's also been really rewarding. Um, and I've also, after all the meetings at um, Robin Phelan's uh, house, where she's just got this amazing collection of ceramic cups and we'd always have like cups of tea and coffee at the meetings um, that I've had since develop my own passion for collecting contemporary ceramic cups. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that's about it. Apart from, I think that maybe I should mention that um, we structurally, we the members uh, pay, can I say how much it is? It's an annual fee of $300. Um, and you can pay more if you want. We have in the past had silent members who just contribute the funds as a, as a philanthropic gesture. 
Um, and it means that the more members we have, the more money we have, and the more money we have to spend. Um, and it, it, so far, it's, it's been really good. And from the very beginning, it was 300, and it hasn't moved from there. So, thank you. Although, we might have to do it about seven. I can. Because the bank account is. Yes, the bank account is. So, thank you. Except to say, if anyone is interested in joining or talking to any of us about setting up your own craft collection, feel free to do that after the talk. So, we can come to do that. phase of, of Bluestone 1 and for my sins ended up being the chair or president or whatever we call ourselves um, at the sort of 8 to 10 year mark of the or during that period um, of the first collection and that was a time when as Anna mentioned before in the constitution there you know 10 years was mentioned as the kind of duration of the collecting period and so at seven or eight years, the, we started to think about, well, we've got this responsibility to um, do something with the collection at this point and started a number of different conversations with um, various institutions. So we went to the NGB, we went to, you know, the major collecting public institutions around Victoria. Um, and spoke with various curators and sought their advice and their interest and trying to gauge their level of interest in what we had. And essentially we got, well, we like this and that, but just the rest of it. Um, so we didn't think that that was going to be acceptable. We didn't want to split that body of work up. And although, you know, you'll see from the slides that it's a pretty eclectic bunch of pieces. Um, the curatorial, there isn't a curatorial framework and there isn't a theme. It's really about where the, where the Bluestone members were at particular times, what work they saw, what work they managed to argue through as worthy of being in the collection. So, um, you know, it's, it's a, as I said, it's quite a eclectic group of works. Um, so, but we did decide that it was important to keep it, try and keep it together. So I came up with this brainy idea that we would put out expressions of interest and invite collecting institutions to gauge, you know, if they would like to hold it. So we sent our, I wrote up this very formal looking document and um, sent that to all the public collecting institutions that we could think of. So universities, um, local council galleries, the majors, regional galleries, regional galleries all the major galleries. Um, and we got some nibbles. Um, so at the same time, we also staged an exhibition of Bluestone One in our previous studio down at the other end, which was much bigger and we had much more exhibition space. And we invited those people to come and have a look at the work. And as I said, we got some nibbles um, and a small number, a good handful, of those institutions did express interest in taking the collection as a whole. And so then we had that brief, you know, letting us we're interested, and then we asked them to come back with a more, um, a more full expression of interest. What would they do with the collection? What were um, their aspirations for it? How did they see it linking into their existing collection, etc.? Um, and from that, we got some much more detailed um, 
applications to have it. And so we had some hard decisions to make. And eventually we, after you know, several discussions amongst the group, came to decide that RMIT University Art Collection was the one that would take it. And the reason that we chose RMIT was um, that a large number of the artists, like something like 80% of the artists that are in Blue Stone One, have a connection with RMIT, whether they're teachers, previous students, current students, in both the ceramics and the jewellery. I think that's maybe a little sculpture program. So there was a really nice link into RMIT um, from our point of view. And the other thing that RMIT were very clear about was how useful the collection was going to be for further research and study and um, you know, as part of their broader university collection which has specific um, collections of fine art and on silversmithing and sculpture, didn't have any ceramics as except for the odd piece that was part of the fine art collection. So this was kind of a, a significant input into their ceramics collection as well. And particularly, that was particularly important for them to obviously demonstrate to their students and researchers that um, you know, RMIT does have a ceramics program, it's had one for a long time, um, but that's an important part of what the School of Art does, particularly at RMIT. So um, we accepted RMIT's offer and um, packed up all the work and sent it off and planned a big shindy to celebrate the handover and COVID hit. <laughs> <laughs> so the works basically have sat in, um, I don't think they're still there, but they got installed in one of the um, university libraries in, um, in, in the Carlton Library in Cardigan Street. Um, and so they sat there in the dark for two years. <laughs> um, um, and we didn't ever have that big shindig, but um, it's not too late. No, perhaps we should remind them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think you know, for both the and as Anna mentioned, for the artists that, whose works in that collection, um, you know, being collected by Bluestone's one thing, but being in the RMIT art collection is a whole other order of significance. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, you know, that's a pretty special um, thing for, for those things to happen. And, you know, the, the Bluestone collection may be shown as a collection or individual pieces may be selected for research loan or whatever else that RMIT does with it. They own it now. We don't have any legal say about what happens to it. I'm sure they're open to suggestions, but... Um, I think um, the process, I think, turned out to be really um, beneficial for us in learning about what we've done um, and what Bluestone had achieved. And uh, yeah, I think it was an important moment. Um, so then we move into, we've given all our work away, COVID's over. We've still been contributing our $300 over the COVID <laughs> years. And so the bank account built up, and then we have, I mean, we had bought a few pieces before the COVID thing hit. Um, but yeah, it's what, we still had a healthy bank balance that had accumulated because people weren't able to exhibit over those couple of years, particularly. Um, and so, yeah, we were able to spend a bit of money in the last 12 to 18 months, which has been really fantastic. So I think it's now time to hand over to Ellie. Do you want to do the formal handover? Or? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Do the segue. No, you know, it's been nice. And thank you so much. That was a really great background thing. It's to say that I always think about it as a snapshot in time. Mm -hmm. So that 10 year list I run was indicative of our taste 
at that 10 years and during that 10 years. And so historically, it will have some kind of, you know, record of that 10 years in craft, mm. if such as such as it is. Such a yeah. 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 So thanks. And now Ellie Janini, <laughs> our current <laughs> president, um, who's going to talk a little bit about Blue Star 2, please. Sure. Thanks, Ellie. <laughs> We do, through Craft Victoria and through lots of different events and galleries and whatever, we are, we find that there is a community there and there's a respect for each other and for, and this is what the Woodstock Collection is based on. And that's how we kind of, you know, now that I'm talking about how we make decisions, it's how we, you know, we do make these decisions by, by, by basically respecting the know-how and the, um, the expertise and, and deep knowledge that our, the members you know, of our group have. So just, um, it's been an incredible journey for me because um, though I've loved craft and remember, and, you know, as far as I can remember as a child and everything, um, entering into a group that has um, this great you know, and deep expertise into the various fields just really opens up a whole lot of um, wonderful ideas. Um, the I'm going to talk a little bit about the decision-making process because as Anna and um, Ben have mentioned, there is a char charter. When we make decisions, there's a set of criteria that we kind of want to tick off, which are the ones that I've mentioned, but there's also a lot of passionate discussion. <laughs> and perhaps now that I'm uh, concentrating on food stuff too, and as being said, we do, we did have those COVID years, but soon after we had um, handed the Bluestone One collection to RMIT, um, again through, I think, a Graph Victoria event, we collected the work, and you'll see it sort of as this thing runs through, runs through the work of Sin Luton, um, Linda behind you, um, and Katrina and Tyler, Tyler yeah. uh, who all exhibited in, in uh, a show at the um, Sofitel, um, which was part, I think, of um, the, was it the annual craft. No, was it Radio Pavilion or was it or was it the map? The, 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 it, was, the it was Radio Pavilion. Yeah. Yeah. So Radio Pavilion, for those who don't know, is uh, a biannual event organised by Claire McArdle, who was the artist that uh, and or we were talking about this kangaroo here, and Chloe Powers. Powell, Powell. Powell sorry, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, Chloe is a curator, Claire is an artist and craft person. And um, again, it's a, I think Melbourne is incredible. It's an amazing place. Um, and Rangan Pavilion and Brewstone, if I do say, <laughs> are, are incredible, um, uh, are, are, uh, an expression of that. Um, of that cultural, you know, cultural life that Melbourne has. It's, it, it, uh, I, I think, you know, I, I originally come from Italy and I, obviously Italy has a lot of history, but the energy and the inventiveness that um, Melbourne, and because I only know about Melbourne really, but I'm sure other cities have got sort of similar, um, similar characteristics, uh, that Melbourne has is extraordinary. Uh, we, we have here Katie <laughs> Scott, who's from Punaki, and uh, she can, you know, attest to that incredible, um, yeah, it, artistry, yeah. it, it, incredible uh, energy that uh, Melbourne has in the crafts. So Bluestone Two started with, you know, those three pieces. Uh, and the decision making, I mean, we pretty much you fell in love with them, really. <laughs> Some of it is very instinctive like that. Um, it was also, the interesting about 
thing about those three pieces of the, the word exhibited together, because these three people um, somehow had some sort of affinity. Um, Anna mentioned the domestic nature of the collection. I mean, while, uh, while jewellery is not necessarily domestic as such, um, it was a really, uh, it was a, it was a, it was a point that um, one of the, uh, in fact, Rebecca Coates, I think, mentioned this. Rebecca Coates is the uh, ex-director of SAM, of the Shepparton Art Gallery. And, you know, she was one of the people that responded to that initial expression of interest. And when she came to see the exhibition, she, went, she came to see Bluestone 1 in that exhibition that we had down, down the road here. The thing that really struck her was this nexus between um, the members of the Bluestone collection, who were all almost craft, craft and artists, and then the domesticity of that, you know, nature of that collection. Um, and, and to institutions like Aramatia, I, mean, I guess, I'm not sure you can <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of like a um, it's kind of like an interesting point in time and an interesting um, way of looking at the collection as a whole. So we went from those three pieces. Um, soon, like it's been mentioned, um, uh, COVID struck, but soon after we also sort of put our heads together and decided that we were lacking and. Uh, for better words, I don't know if this is the right, we were lacking an indigenous focus which we wanted to kind of, you know, um, bring to the collection. So, either during COVID or I can't remember Must now, just time, we, we um, looked at an exhibition at Flinders, Flinders Lane, Flinders Street Gallery, Flinders Lane, Flinders Lane. Flinders Lane Gallery at, in the Nicholas Building. Um, and they were exhibiting Annette Shaw and one behind the bin. This was Janine Gowley. Janine Gowley, that's right. Um, it was a fantastic show, a brilliant show, um, hmm. which brought a lot of discussion in the group because, of course, these are very delicate works. It's a bit like what we mentioned before about the, um, the kangaroo head, which is a, a leather piece. Um, hand dyed and all that. The the uh, the the um, the materials themselves or pieces like that do need a bit, you know, a certain level of care, which is always brings always brings interesting discussions in the group because of course we don't have a gallery space that you know in our own homes. You know, we don't necessarily. Uh, have all the you know air conditioning and whatever that 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 you're sort of supposed to have in order to conserve the pieces, but but by um, collecting pieces like this, it also makes us conscious that there is you know how do we handle those materials? How, and Ben Ben has been particularly great at um, you know the packaging thing. How do we package these things? How do we look after them? Because after all, it's a you know, the each collection is five, ten years long. So ten years is quite a, quite a length of time which to care for the pieces. Um, so touch wood where the wood is. <laughs> um, as I'm here to speak about the process, you know, it's been an interesting discussion because of course we also know of other people. Jennifer and Paul here can tell us about their pro you know, they they call they've collected art over many years. And everyone, every group has a different way of, you know, setting up how how do you select the pieces, how do you collect them, how the, what criteria do you have, but also who makes the final decision. And in our case, well, the way that we make the decisions is someone's aware of the exhibition or the you know the event that the art is displayed in, and makes a proposal. The proposal has. You know, it doesn't have to be very long. It could be like a paragraph or two of, of why they think that this is an important um, exhibition to go and see, why this is an important artist that we should be 
um, considering and something about the piece itself. Um, sometimes um, the piece is very representative of the work or sometimes, like in the, in the earlier um, collection, uh, there's a piece that, uh, it's a ceramic piece that represented a sort of a leap into an unknown area by that, say, that artist. And we've had this in this, in this collection as well, like um, the Tanya Rowland piece up there on the, on the right hand side, top right hand side. There was a lot of discussion when we selected that piece about the sort of the progression of that particular artist's work. And I'm not a ceramicist, so maybe you're only a You can tell us whether you are. Um, but I remember the discussion. Robin Fiona was there. Mm -hmm. I was there on the cover of the Sue or something. Me. Yeah. yeah. So that was one of the best yeah. discussions. That was, that yeah. was one of the most fun discussions because we knew we wanted a piece, yeah. but we just didn't know which piece. Yes. So we had to drill down and drill down and drill yes. down. It was quite a difficult <laughs> decision making hard <laughs> decision <laughs> process. It was really quite. Um, and of course, that particular artist um, had in her previous work was quite different from, from, from this work. So people have sort of had, oh, I think my, yeah, Fiona, you were mm. there. Yeah, we were so there. So I don't know, just read, just speak up if I don't remember <laughs> what, um, exactly what, uh, what group. And of course that artist is now doing other things, just, you know, it's kind of interesting for us to, to look at that um, progression of, of, of someone's work. Now I'm skipping a bit, but the Ebony Russell work in the middle here, which was which is one of our most recent purchases. Um, in fact, it was just recently at the um, uh, design fair uh, in the exhibition buildings. Um, we have been Jane alerted us to to Ebony's work from memory, and we had been looking at her um, at her. Uh, and her work, because she's not actually Victorian, is she? She's just, yeah, she, she was originally, but she's Sydney. Based. She's Sydney based, so that's one of the things that is also quite difficult. Sometimes we really want to collect an artist, but they just don't happen to have <laughs> a show in Victoria, so we, we kind of wait for occasions when we do. But one of the interesting things, that, and and the the because. Uh, the design fair was such a big event. We decided to get together as a group and actually go and see the whole fair as a group, which was one, which was a really fantastic um, decision because we were able to just all sit around the table and discuss the various pieces that you know were being shown at the at the fair, and eventually um, you know honed in on on Ebony's work. Um, because, as Jane, I think, has pointed out in the past, it's a very, that work, being terracotta, but having the, the lustre applied to the terracotta, is a kind of, I mean, uh, you, you, you say it much more eloquently than you, Jane, so maybe I can't no, no. say it, is, is a very unusual, you know, a kind of, um, almost contradictory, thing that you would do in a, in a, as a ceramicist. There's so many pieces and that, you know, we don't necessarily, like, I mean, we go from plastics to, you know, more traditional ceramics to obviously metal smiths like um, Nicole Polenta's work down here, who also, who collected last year. So, yeah. so in the last couple of years, you know, once COVID, so, well, we, we kind of got to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, we talk about Roseanne Bartley because we actually didn't, yes. that was from an online exhibition mm -hmm. during oh, COVID. So true. I remember there was a lot of discussion yes. about, this is, that an an is this yes. an exhibition? Yes, um, because we were kind of starved, but also because we were so, we, 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 we've always aligned with Roseanne's work. Um, and actually, I should also say that it becomes, there's a, there's, because Roseanne was a member of the group, not when we collected this particular piece, but had previously been a member of the group. And we have a piece um, 
by Jane here, who which is got this grey piece behind me, behind me. We're deeply conscious of the sort of the ethics of that. Um, but one of the you know as part of the rules of the of the of the collecting and of the decision making is that if for by chance um, we are looking at an exhibition and a, at a piece in an exhibition that does belong to it, whose you know authorship is within the group, the idea is to exclude that person completely. So they don't even, they don't even know that we're looking at that at that work. Um, and that's kind yeah, of how. Can I just it, ask you? Yes. This was the very question I'm yes. going to ask about. Given the fabulous focus of gifting the collection yeah. to esteemed establishments like that uh, like you've got in your collecting talented exceptional artists yeah. who don't get to then be part of that. They're, they're not represented in that gifting. Um, I just thought I'd make you feel like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mean you mean um, like if you yes just, you know, yes if you all love to piece by one of you yeah mm -hmm. but you can do that it's just exclude. yeah we can we oh can, you exclude yeah. them from the discussion we we yes. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 I thought we were excluding the work no no no, no. Okay. Okay. that's for, exactly for that reason mm -hmm. because we yeah. think it's unfair if we yeah. exclude them from yeah. the collection yeah. but. We do need to do it in a well. There's two. There's two things. One is we need to do it in an ethical way. So, so we need to. And secondly, is that uh, I don't think it would be very nice for that person to know. Having <laughs> 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 well, yes. considered their work, we decided well, we wouldn't know. No, I mean, <laughs> no, but you know, it's not that. It's actually that we decide for whatever reason that it doesn't fit with the yeah. collection at the time, or it's. It's not representative of something that we're looking for or whatever. Yeah. But we we do handle it in a sort of you know we do compartmentalise the decision making yeah. process so that the artists that are actually part of the collection don't get to know yeah. that that piece, their piece yeah. is being discussed. So the, the conversation happens offline yeah. kind of thing. And then which you, is not that hard. And then do you strike a bargain? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <You know. laughs> That's something that we want to say. No, no, we don't. Um, so, what have I not covered? Um, uh, yeah, so, I mean, for me, it's been an incredible experience. Um, it's been, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, at once, you know, challenging from uh, challenging from a a governance point of view because um, there's lots of differing, differing, ex you know, experiences, opinions, tastes, expertise. There's, you know, there's a lot of factors. Um, it's it's a learning process, um, which is you know an amazing thing to be part of. Um, and it's also you know the out. The other thing is about doing something that we feel is worthwhile because in the end it's really adding, it's a cultural thing, you know, it's, it, it's adding to something that we feel is important to preserve and, 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 and cherish. Thank you. And yeah, the one thing that I wanted to say at the beginning, which I didn't get to say, was that what you just finished up on, which was that objects are symbols of our culture just as much as any any art form. Whatever it is, we're dealing with cultural things and we're adding value to our culture that we live in. And we feel as a group very proud of that, that we've actually managed to do that. And, I, I like you, you know, I just feel so um, lucky to be part of a group that can take, make these decisions as, a, you know, with warmth and generosity and friendship and camaraderie with a very serious eye to <laughs> adding to our culture and the culture that we live in now and that we receive and that we're part of. 
So um, the other thing I was thinking about as you were speaking, Ellie, was that because we collect so widely, I mean, within craft, obviously mm. contemporary craft, but we collect quite widely in terms of what we, I mean, it may not seem like when you're in it because there's a lot of ceramics and a lot of jewellery, but I was thinking about um, the comparison. When I lived in Japan as a young person, I was training as a ceramic artist in Japan, and I was so enamoured with the fact that collectors in Japan would often collect uh, one person over their whole lifetime, and they would collect a different piece from different genres of work that they would create over a lifetime, and I thought that that was just a wonderful Maybe that's what we're going to do for Blue Stone 3. Pick one person. <laughs> um, what else did I want to say? Um, but that's an interesting... I mean, that's... You know, it, it's it's kind of... Um, there are so many different ways that yeah, you, could, doing it. you could do it. Yeah. You could do it. And, and of course, if you're, a, if you're an individual collecting, you do it in a different mm -hmm. way. That's a, a, a different to how a group mm -hmm. is, yeah. collects. But yeah. For us, the, the discussion itself is part of the, you know, part of the fun. Yeah. And um, we'd like, and part of the purpose of today was to encourage other people to start collecting too. Mm -hmm. So if any of you want to start, definitely <laughs> come and talk to us and hang around and hope that this has given you some inspiration. Um, and the only other thing to say is that our really our heroes are materials processes and ideas, mm -hmm. but sometimes materials and processes more than ideas because that's what's not being collected in the institutions mm -hmm. and we don't even have a department for craft, mm -hmm. you know, let alone, mm -hmm. you know, it comes sort of under the, in the NGV, it comes under the auspices of design and architecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, or just, you know, yeah. you, if they do collect design, something yeah. craft-based or material and process-based, it'll fit into another department somehow. So, uh, you know, right back, you know, 15 years ago, I think that was, correct me if I'm wrong, because I wasn't a founding member, Anna, but that was one of the, um, the sort of black holes, too, that you were trying to fill. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That it wasn't, craft was almost ignored mm. um, in public collections. Oh, and and yes, and that's right. From the very beginning, it was never going to be a profit-making collection. Yeah. We, from the very beginning we've always knew that we were going to donate it to an institution so that we were contributing to craft being in the institution. Yeah, having voice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just ask you, how do you know when your collection is complete? Oh, <laughs> good question. Yes. When we run out so of money. <laughs> 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 yeah. So we set a 10 year limit for each time. But at least don't test five. Didn't we set five years for We did time? actually review. Yeah. We said, well, let's do Bluestone 2 for five years. And we've actually got nearly the same number of pieces in five years that we did in 10 years with mm. Bluestone 1. Mm. So there's a momentum that's, there's a momentum that's <laughs> built up. Um, yeah. I don't know mm. if funds have changed or crafts has got cheaper or yeah. what. Yeah. <laughs> it hasn't got cheaper. I think we've had a very uh, enthusiastic membership. Yeah. Yeah. And part of the, I mean, it's, you know, we we wonder. There's there's been various um, at various times there's been talk about expanding the membership by you know doing drives and you know to, to get to get people in and and that's still a possibility. I mean, obviously, the decision making process when you have a bigger group would be a, a more involved thing or, or we'd, have, we'd have to decide to do it. In fact, we talked to Jennifer and a couple of other people at, at, at one point about their decision making process, which is quite different in some yeah. some yeah. You, you, you had said this, this is too. so much nicer. Is it? But yeah. you can well, I think the fact that you can all get you can get the whole group together and walk around the design fair. Yeah. and have conversations about what you've seen and what you're interested in and the pros and cons. Yeah. We, you know, we couldn't ever have done that because of much Why enough. Not? Well, because our decision making was through a committee elected every year. Okay. And um, even getting the committee together was extremely difficult. Um, 
and your committee, your, sorry, your members, your private practitioners, I think. Yes, most yeah. of us. I think, again, that's a, dis, a defining difference. Yeah. Yeah. We were interested in art. There were a couple who we could maybe say had stronger lenses than that, but the rest of us were just interested mm -hmm. in art. Yeah. Um, and it, but we were, certainly went through, like I, the best thing I love about your group is that you are doing this not-for-profit that the collection is being passed on. When I joined my first art collecting group, I had naively assumed that's what we were doing. And it was a rude shock when I discovered <laughs> investment. <laughs> that is not, and I ended up being a member of three groups, mm -hmm. they're all teenagers. Um, and I look at the size of your pieces and I just get envy. <laughs> like, we've got massive canvases. And as you age, you think, how am I going to downsize? <laughs> um, well, my children have some thoughts on that. <laughs> you just pass it on. Um, but I love the, I think the processes you go through, you will, yours will be a much more engaged, educative and enjoyable process. There were tensions at times in some of the groupings I was in. There was definitely one collection where the focus was on um, maximising investment. That was very uncomfortable really uncomfortable because we were we were then buying artworks that were very expensive initially with the view that they were going to increase in value which they did um which when we come to do the end of 10 year auction there's only a certain number of people in the group one or two who can afford to fork out 30 or 40 thousand for a painting you know, so that ate away at the heart mm -hmm. a bit. Um, so, so there might be people who are totally in that, in, you know, in love with some of the work. There's no they, way that yeah, they could afford. Yeah. yeah, and the off spin is though, you are getting, you're getting yes, of course, a financial yeah. benefit yeah. from yeah. the end you tell yeah. But we we never went in it for money. We were in it for education and you know the, the process. Um, Thank you. That's yeah. really interesting. Um, yeah, there's a big difference because we haven't. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Cinder, you had a question before. Did you? Oh, ask it was comment? answered by. Oh, okay. It was what was the period of collection? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So ten and five. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? How did you come up with the name? Oh, oh yeah. well, I. It was a lot of discussion, and for some reason, I actually thought it was Kevin Murray. Like we we put a whole lot of things together, um, and and, and but if Bluestone was a really good one because we knew it was Victorian, mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't necessarily Melbourne. Yep. Um, and the yeah, so I thought it was Kevin who said that, but when I was talking to Roseanne Bartley, she said she cannot. <laughs> 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 yeah, so it says yeah. Victorian as soon as you hear it. Yes, it does. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. 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 Any other questions or comments or any anything to add? Well, I'd like to then. Wrap it up. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you, Harvey. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Everyone, thank you. Thank you to the viewers speaking. And have a great, have a great